So here's what we're going to do, everybody, and I would hope that as these presentations have been made, that your curiosity has been uh, piqued, and that you may now have some questions that you would like to put to our panel members. We have some wonderful ushers who are working on each of the three blocks that you're sitting in, and then what we are going to do is invite you to raise your hand if you have a question you'd like to put, and then we will direct, I will select the question to be put, and we will direct one of our ushers with the microphone to you. If you would like to introduce yourself, your name, if you have an affiliation with an organization, you're welcome to let us know that as well. And then please let us know who your question is for and ask your question, and then we will have our panel here respond. I know it takes a little bit of courage to put your hand up, and even more perhaps to put a question, uh, but please have that courage and do so. This is the opportunity for us with these wonderful presenters to have questions that you're curious about answered uh, or particular points that are significant and important for you. Thank you very much. Appreciate your courage in the middle of the middle block here. If you wouldn't mind just keeping your hand up uh, and standing, thank you, and we'll have the microphone delivered to you presently. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name's Anita. I'm in my late 20s, and I just wanted to ask the question, who is your target audience? I guess more for the Tara um, people. When you have this information, who are you giving it to? Because I have an interest in Sir Peter Blake and what he has done for us because of my mother's introduction um, to for me in, in everything that Sir Peter Blake did. But I haven't really heard anything since. And I don't know whether that's just because I'm not in the right circles or what. And I think it's a shame because you have all this important information and I haven't heard it. So I'm just wondering who your target audiences are to maybe be more a part of that circle. Kia ora, Anita. So that question's for you, Roman. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, actually, we have uh, three targets, four targets. The first one is, I mean, the, the basic one is science, because everything that is collected, every data that is taken, Every information that we have from the ocean is open data, is open source, shared with any scientist across the world. They have access through uh, databases uh, freely. That's one. Uh, the second audience, uh, in, 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 I think in, uh, in size, is uh, the, the general audience through the media, uh, mainly French media, but whenever you, you publish these science papers, this has triggered uh, 1,000 pa papers, 1,000 articles in 100 countries in 10 days. So this global reach. And uh, we are uh, crafting uh, curriculums for schools. But we speak to the kids through the schools. And it's very hard to reach the kids directly. So we, take the, we choose to, to target the, the, skill good, the, good ski the school kids, the school kids. Uh, with the teachers, and that's what we do uh, uh, and every day now. A lot, a lot, effectively, a lot is done in French so far. We need to be wider now. It's gone the way. And the last, and the last uh, target is politicians. At the UN, we, we managed to take the scientists on the stage at the UN uh, many times. We managed to do side events, explaining stuff, uh, and these are the fourth targets we have. We try to do all of the main targets, but of course it's, uh, it's a bit of spread out, but I think it's what we need, and we need time. I mean, we always say uh, we have no time, it is too late, but we have time to change, we have time to teach, we have time to engage our, the new generation for the next 25, 30 years. I think we need to take the time to, for that. Thank you, Roman, appreciate that. And uh, thank you for the question, Anita, and for, for leading us off with the question session. Uh, so I'd invite uh, somebody else to raise their hand if they have a question, please. Again, in the uh, middle block towards the front here, please, for our usher. If you wouldn't mind just standing again, thank you. Kia ora, my name's Emily, and I love the oceans. Thank you for your talks, all of you. 
I have a question for Roman about your expedition through Japan. What was it that you were looking at? Was it, for example, the impacts of the nuclear um, power plant fallout? And did you, if it was, did you see anything? And can you tell us about it, please? Thank you, Emily, for the question. Just a quick little translation going on here. No, the sound is not very nice for her. Okay. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm French, <laughs> of course. Uh, in Japan, we, we in Japan we it was a, we did a, a survey of the coral reefs uh, in August, in Shijima, south of Japan, and all the, the the archipelagos of islands from the Ryukyus, you know, the one from the southern tip of uh, the the main islands and uh, Okinawa. This was a study we did from Tokyo to, to Okinawa. Uh, but we spent a lot of time, I mean, we spent more than a month, uh, all the crew, and it was a crazy venture to uh, call in eight harbors in Japan to talk to them about the ocean without confrontation talking about the fisheries, but we tried to talk to them about what the ocean is doing for them every day. Ocean, atmosphere, oxygen they breathe, uh, the fish they catch is coming from the uh, heathy ocean, and maybe in the future, if we are not careful, this, will mean this life support system may not sustain. So we tried to tackle that. We didn't, we haven't gone to the, 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 the nuclear issues area in Fukushima this time. We're gonna go, go there next year. And uh, effectively, this will be the time to talk about it. And, uh, but in Japan, is such a weird place. Weird people. <laughs> They're not like us. That's, 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 they don't think like us. They, it was a crazy, I think it was a crazy time for us all on the boat. Uh, but it was very interesting, actually. And uh, we need to, it's a hard, it's very different. We are very different. And before putting them the head in below the water that you are doing, you are a bad fisherman, you fish too much, you, 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 you rule the, ruin the ocean with your nuclear uh, leaks. Uh, they had a lot of effort to do to understand them, how they think, how they, they can change. Thank you, Raman. Excuse me, just uh, shading the lights here and, and sort of looking in the distance. A uh, middle block all the way down the back row there, please, Usher. So just be a, a few seconds. And same process, please, if you wouldn't mind uh, just taking the microphone and introducing yourself uh, and who your question is for, and then your question, please. Yes, my name is David. Um, I'm an Australian. I feel friendly here. Um, and I'm at the end of a 10-year yacht uh, cruise around the world. Um, my question is this. Uh, there's an enormous resource out there called Yachtsman, and in the city of Sales, all the more so. I've met thousands of yachtsmen. Can I ask you, how do you utilize that resource, and what suggestions do you, do, do you give to do so? Thank you. Uh, thank you for asking the question. We, since uh, four years now, we, with a scientist involved in Tara, called Bond de Vargas, and also with an uh, association in New Zealand as well, we developed a, a project called Plankton Planet. And if you, if you connect to this website, you can, if you want to go on the loop, uh, there's a loop here, you, Kiwi land, uh, Fiji land, Vanuatu and back. Uh, if you want to do this loop, you could do a plankton collection every day, every day or so. But the problem is that f so far, you have to go down to two knots. And when you're a, a, a cruiser, ah, uh, uh, you don't want to go to two knots. You don't want to get the sail down. You don't, you don't want to bing bang in the, in the ocean like that. So to collect plankton, you don't even see. So we are working now to develop, To we spend the week here to work on that. There is 15 people of us coming from all over the place uh, uh, to find ways to be able to do that in five knots. And I think we will be more, much more successful in the future to go to avoid stopping down the the, the boat, yeah. So it's the future, and we, of course, when you talk about the ocean, and you see, we so we barely know nothing about what's living in the ocean, and this is not only the survey boat across the planet who can do the job. 
You're right. The resource we have on the yachtsman, the cruisers across the planet uh, is huge, and uh, we are definitely uh, intending to, to, to tap into it and to engage people in that. Thank you for the question. I'll add to that too. Thank you, David. Uh, you may already be a, a part of or aware of an organisation called Sailors for the Sea, and you're quite right. There are uh, thousands of sailors who are exploring, sailing and caring about our marine planet as we speak. Uh, and I'd also add you're very welcome here, David, as an Australian. Of course, the skipper of Emirates Team New Zealand is an Australian, so I hope you celebrate along with us tomorrow in the parade. Uh, so welcome in the best Anzac spirit. Uh, another question, please. Uh, again, in the middle block, come on, outside blocks, we're not, uh, oh, middle block uh, just in the front here, and I'll come to you, thank you very much, in the right block after that. So uh, about the fifth row black middle back, middle block, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is also David, um, and I'm an Aucklander, and this is a related question, uh, particularly for you, Rochelle, if I may. Um, I'm an Aucklander, I have a small boat, and with my family we love to explore the Hauraki Gulf. Uh, if there was one thing you would like Aucklanders to do differently, one behavior change you think could make a considerable difference to our big blue black yard, what would you ask us all to do? Assuming we do, we like to behave responsibly as best we can, and we like to do the obvious, what's the thing, the big change we need to make? I think for for all Aucklanders is thinking about what comes off the land part and goes into the sea. We have um, issues with you know, storm water, with sewage runoff, and of course with just rubbish going off, you know, off our land and into the sea. I think for those Aucklanders on the water, <laughs> and there are very many, you know, we're usually not too far from the land, we quite like the land, but for all the Aucklanders that are on the water, I think have a seriously good think about your fishing practices because they, we need to think about how we, um, the gear we use, how we use it. We need to think about is there a risk for a bycatch of a seabird, for example. We have very high bycatch of seabirds and, and little hooks, just, you know, the little hook you throw off the side of your boat, just through lack of awareness, there's some great education campaigns around how to make your your fishing seabird safe. And also what you're catching, how many fish are you catching? Um, and also how much you're taking from around the, the coastlines as well. You know, our mussels, our cockles, our, you know, all of those things as well. So on the land, thinking about what comes off our land into the water. And then when you're on the water, thinking about your fishing practices. Thank you, Rochelle. And thank you, David, for the question. I'll just add my thought to that if I, I might as well. Um, my, my view on it is that we need to go through a fundamental attitude change, that fishing is not a right, it's a privilege. Uh, and what that means is if we adopt that particular attitude, that means we don't fish to the limits uh, that are given to us. Uh, we fish for, as a privilege, only what we need and we're very careful in our decision making about where we go, how we do it and what we do. And leadership first starts with leadership of self. Uh, and if we lead ourselves, then we have the right or the ability to perhaps lead others. So uh, thanks for the question and the opportunity to share my thoughts. Now, I promised I would come over to the right group here, so apologies that I missed that before. There was a gentleman uh, middle of the right group who was waving. Uh, so about third from the aisle, please. Thank you for your patience. My name is uh, Reg Lawson. I'm a fourth generation New Zealander on all sides. Um, I've dived from the age of 13 and I'm now 73. Um, I've seen a lot of changes in all that time, most of them for the worst. Um, what I, I attended a, an Oceans 40 years ago <coughs> where a Dr. Sylvia Earle warned of the pollution of the trenches around the world. And I think it was last year, Neva said, oh, there's pollution in the trenches of the ocean. And to quote a plumber, shit doesn't run uphill. Um, 
I'm just wondering how the heck we can actually um, deal with this problem because that's, I think, where the ocean is getting poisoned. And as you know, if the oceans die, we die. It's as simple as that. I was just wondering if you knew of any way that they're improving this situation apart from just the shallow waters. Thank you. Thank you, Ridge. Uh, any one of the panel members like to, to take that question? Yeah, it's a, a very good point. I, th I do think we must also remember we have made progress. You know, if you think oh, probably about 30, 40 years ago, everything got dumped into the ocean. You know, absolutely everything. And, and you know, the London Dumping Convention, as it was at the time, you know, actually got rid of a lot of the real egregious crimes against the planet where the, the ocean was just considered a big tip. And so, you know, and same with um, runoff from factories into, to, um, you know, rivers and estuarine spaces. I think one of the great challenges for us, and this is where technology and engineering and ingenuity is really important, and, and allowing people to think of completely wacky ideas and not dismissing them out of hand. We have to think about all crazy ideas, good ideas, random ideas, and really give them an airing to solve these problems. And there's recently that, that Dutch child, uh, boy, who um, teenager, who sort of thought of a big... Um, machine that just, well it's not even a machine really, it's just a passive thing that's floating around out in the ocean and picking up rubbish. And it's working. You know, sure it's not perfect, but it's actually working. We know where the major rubbish gyres are. And I think there is now we're getting to the point where why don't we work out how to just go out there and pick up a whole bunch of that rubbish? It's not hard to find. Sure, there are some things like in the deep trenches that we won't be able to get to to tidy up. But I do think if we don't add to it, then it, it won't get any worse. You know, and, and they're, they're, they're really wicked problems, but I do think that one thing about humans are we are um, infinitely curious and we're always thinking of ingenious new solutions to problems. And sometimes it's the most obvious, simple thing. So I think we need that space to, to voice those possibilities. And we need to share that because, you know, within Japan, uh, three weeks, three months ago, and I've been in a, a front of a crowd like you, and I asked the question to Japanese, do I have, how, much, how long do you think the plastic bottles disappear in the ocean by itself? How long? I raised a hand. A week? Another guy, another lady at the back. Two weeks? And at the, in the end, okay, no, let's go for it. Uh, three months? Yeah, a century. They were like uh, shocked, 1,000 people ahead in front of me. So you realize such a country like Japan, educated, sophisticated, uh, rich, is not able to teach his population this type of basic ideas, basic notions. Here we are, here we stand, and now we, and in Japan there is maybe five, six NGOs only. There's no, we have to, leverage that, we need to work on that as well. So it's not only, it's everywhere on the planet, so the problem is global, but it's education is, for me, education is the key of everything. Um, that with your experience that you see that number one issue is pollution because actually from our experience with young people, it's the thing that concerns them most as well. Um, but what gives me heart um, with young people is um, we did a microbeads plastic lab at Auckland Uni with Yelf, and then we got all these calls from parents when they came home because the kids had raided the um, medicine cabinets at home and chucked out all their parents' kind of makeup and creams that were contributing to that pollution. Um, so, our, you know, we hear a lot of stories about our young people, negative stories in the paper, but actually they really care about these environment, uh, environmental issues. They want to make a difference and they're really ready to act. So we need to create the space for them to do that and engage them in those conversations. The other thing that I watch that's really different with them is um, that those of us, um, you know, of my generation, you know, we might look at potentially one or two situations or solutions. Um, our kids in this generation, you know, they're very quick to look at technology and, you know, 25 different solutions. 
I remember um, one expedition when we were on and we talked about problems with recreational fishing and capturing um, how many fish are being taken. And that night one of the students created an app to be able to monitor recreational fish take. So you know, our kids are smart and they're really, really motivated. Thank you um, to the three panellists and thank you to Reg for the question. All right, we'll share it over to the left block here now. Uh, and I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to take all questions. We've only got a couple of more minutes, but we do want to uh, have a representative from Team Left Block uh, to go ahead. Thank you. Uh, bonsoir, Romain. I'm Rosaria. I'm the National French Advisor, and we love French here in New Zealand. Um, we have about 60,000 students learning French, um, 550 teachers across the country. Could we have some resources for our French curriculum from you, please? It's open source. Yes, of course, open source, Merci my beaucoup. dear. Très bien. <laughs> I'll come and talk to you afterwards. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> no, but to every parent, you t I, I did it myself with my daughter. She was six years old. You take her once, once, one hour on the beach clean, beach cleaning, once in your lifetime, one hour, and she will bother you for the rest of your life when she, she will shout at people, hey, look at this guy over there. <laughs> He's, he's, he's strong, this one, not this one. <laughs> Do it. Thank you for the question and, and Ramon for the answer, reminding us, as Shelley did, of the power of, of our young people. Um, my apologies that I am calling uh, a, an end to the question session at the moment, but uh, I'm sure that there are other opportunities to engage in conversations with one another and with our panellists as we draw things to a close. What I'd like to do in, uh, before we hand over to our person to deliver a vote of thanks is to acknowledge all of the people in the room here. I recognise that one of the reasons that you are here is because you genuinely care about the sea and about our environment. And I know that many of you here have dedicated a huge amount of your time, effort and your money to making a difference for our marine planet. And I want to acknowledge and thank you for all the organizations, all the work, and all of the commitment that you've shown. Uh, you are part of the answer, and thank you for your work and commitment to that. I started this evening. Oh, okay, Ramon, good, very good. Give yourself a clap, yeah, nice.